Okay. There's a retired pastor friend, and every week he sends out a little encouraging email to a lot of the pastors on Saturday evening. And he reminded me of something that I hadn't thought about for a while. Today we celebrate not only the birth of the Savior, but the resurrection. Christmas doesn't come on Sundays too often. Remember, Sunday is the day we remember the resurrection. So we have a double, really a double holiday. We're remembering the birth and the resurrection of the Lord, and that makes it a very special day. Even though we may be few in number here, we're still celebrating. I'll be reading the Christmas story from Luke this morning. Very familiar passage in Luke chapter 2. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made by Serenius when Serenius was governor of Syria. Of Syria. And all went to be taxed, every one into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth unto Judea under the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that when they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were in the same country shepherds, abiding in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which should be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you, you shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And it came to pass, as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us now go even unto Bethlehem, and to see this thing which has come to pass which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the same which was told them concerning this child. And all they that heard it wondered at the things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all things, kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned to glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen as it was told unto them. And now Matthew chapter 2, just two verses there, first two verses. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. We're going to talk about journeying this morning, traveling to see the king. <clears throat> 2,000 years ago, people were traveling for a lot of different reasons, just like today. But many of those people were traveling in Judea, were traveling to their ancestral home because of the taxation demanded by Caesar Augustus there in the Romans. And among those thousands of people who were traveling up and down the roads those days from Nazareth were couple named Joseph and Mary. And the Bible tells us that Mary was great with child. She was ready to deliver the child seemingly at any moment. But of course, that's in the hands of God. <clears throat> and we know that that birth was not going to occur until they arrived in Bethlehem so they could be in fulfillment of the prophecy. I'm not sure if any of us really appreciate the uh, difficulty in the long journey at 90 miles from Nazareth to Bethlehem. You know, we live in a time where we're spoiled. 90 miles, we don't think much about it. We get in the car, 
We start it up and we drive. What's it going to be? It doesn't take long. Two hours or so tops. If we get hungry, we stop and get something to eat. If we decide to take a longer trip, there are hotels and motels along the way where we can rest and be comfortable. But 2,000 years ago, it was a lot different, wasn't it? It was a difficult journey. You remember, Mary and Joseph are not of the upper class. They didn't have any kind of carts or for transportation. They didn't have a great deal of wealth, so they had to walk. Perhaps there was a donkey that Mary could ride upon, but just consider how difficult, how hard it was for Mary to travel 90 miles from one place to another in her condition. And then think of the time that's involved. As I said, for us, 90 miles is really nothing. We want to do it a couple of hours, depending on traffic, road conditions, and that sort of thing. But just how far could Joseph and Mary travel in a day? You know, they had roads in that day, but they weren't like the roads we have today. You know, we, co we complain about our roads because they're a little bumpy here or there, but they're paved, they take us everywhere. And those days, they were dirt roads, and there were stones and different things in their way. <clears throat> so it wasn't easy even to walk on those roads. But there's one thing that hasn't changed over these years, and that's the sin nature of man. So not only were the road conditions a problem, but because of the sin nature of man, there were thieves and robbers and cutthroats along the way. And just as we see today at Christmas how people have to watch what they're doing because, you know, the thieves really ramp up their work. Don't you think that people 2,000 years ago knew there'd be a lot of travelers on the road? Something else to watch out for, the thieves. You know, crime is not something that's unique to our culture. We didn't invent it. We've just kind of perfected it more. And let's say that even if Joseph and Mary could travel as much as 10 miles a day, and I think that's pushing it for a woman this far along in her labor. You know, the tip, trip would have taken them about nine days. Nine days. Nine days of sleeping on the ground. Nine days of eating whatever they could carry with them. There weren't any restaurants to stop and, you know, can't go and get a Whopper. <clears throat> Nine days of being out in the elements, the rain, the sun, the hot, the cold, the night, the day. Nine days of sore feet, painful backs, and for Barry, a great deal more difficult and discomfort, more than we can grasp. So it wasn't an easy trip at all. But I think there's an idea among many people today, many Christians, that the trip from Nazareth to Bethlehem was poof, and they were there. They were just miracle to, to Bethlehem, but that's not true. But they continued onward, but they weren't continuing onward because of the tax. That was the, what God used to prompt them to leave, to go to Bethlehem, but they were moving because they're being led by the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit is going to allow them to arrive safely in Bethlehem for the birth of the Messiah. There's one thing I didn't mention about this trip, and that is that they were not alone. God was with them. God had a plan. God had a purpose. And he was guiding and protecting them. And nothing was going to stop God's plan for the birth of the Savior. As we read, and so it was that while they were there, speaking of in Bethlehem, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. She brought forth her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger. That was the first people we see traveling. There'd be others <clears throat> on that day, that evening, that'll be traveling to see Jesus when he was born in that lowly stable. They were the shepherds. You know, in those days, the shepherds were considered outcasts if you go back in time even from bethlehem let's go back to egypt <clears throat> when the family of jacob went down when israel went into egypt they were placed up in goshen why were they placed up in goshen it was god's plan yes but 
<clears throat> excuse me, they were in Goshen because they were shepherds. They were herdsmen. And they were looked down upon even by the Egyptians even way back then. And so we see that they are looked down on as the lowest class of people. They were only looked slightly better than criminals and a little bit better than the Romans. As far as class, they're way down. They're the lowest class of people mostly that people would see. The shepherds were dirty and smelly because they spent most of their time in the field and around sheep. And since sheep have a sheep smell, the shepherds are going to have a sheep smell. And how do people judge other people? By the way they look, the way they talk, and the way they smell. And that's why they were looked down on. And these shepherds in the field that night had no idea of what was about to take place. They didn't know what was happening over in that stable in Bethlehem. I imagine the shepherds were probably relaxing at least as much as they could by their fires that night. <clears throat> and to them, that night was like countless other nights that they'd had before them. They hear the baying of the sheep, the rustling of the wind. They're on guard for predators to come after the sheep. But something happened that night that they would never forget, and they could never have imagined it would happen to them. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord showed round about them. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them. I want you to look at one little word in verse 9. The, and lo, the angel of the Lord. The. Isn't that important? The means there's only one. Now, if we go back through Scripture, who do we see identified as the angel of the Lord? The angel of the Lord wrestled with Jacob. The angel of the Lord came upon Abraham in his tent and walked with him on the road to Sodom. That is a pre-incarnate Christ. Isn't it amazing? The angel of the Lord is in the field making the announcement of the birth of the Savior and that he's in the manger. Isn't that an amazing thing? And the reaction of these shepherds is pretty much what my reaction would have been. They were so afraid. If I'm in the field and an angel appears to me, I'm going to be afraid. And so were you. But there's something you may overlook again in this passage and listen again. And, and here it is. See if you can find it. The angels told the shepherds, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which should be to all people. That verse tells us a great deal about the shepherds. It tells us that they were people, even though they were looked down upon by the nation, they were looked down as second-class citizens, those shepherds believed the Word of God. They had hearts for the Lord. How do I know? Because every time an angel appears or any warning in Scripture that fear not, you're talking to believers. I think as someone said, there's 365 times in Scripture we're told to fear not. Believers fear not. These men, even though they looked down upon, they had faith. They probably had more faith than the, the teachers and the rabbis over in the temple. Have you ever noticed how the lowliest people on the face of the earth turn to the Lord Jesus Christ quicker than any other people? If we watch Jesus' ministry, it's the lowly folks that come first. Why is that? I believe the reason is because they realize their resources are limited. And they know that they can't do anything on their own. They have to turn to the Lord because they don't have much. They look to the Lord to provide for them. They're more aware of the grace of the Lord than those who have so much in material assets. Because when you have much, you begin to depend upon what you have. And it makes it harder for you to Turn to the Lord. <clears throat> Excuse me. The shepherds knew they needed the Lord in their lives. 
That's the reason that the lowliest people seem to have a much easier time coming to the Lord than those who have plenty. <clears throat> the angels came to the shepherds that night to deliver the good news, but they were not to fear. I've often wondered, even when they, they tell you, don't fear, how long is it before that heart quits beating that fast? You know what I'm talking about. You ever been, you've been that frightened where you can actually feel your heart pumping with fear. I wonder how long it was before it settled down. I don't think it was very long because immediately the angel of the Lord takes their mind off of their fear and he goes to directions to follow for them and to identify the child. For unto us, is, unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. The city of David, of course, is Bethlehem. And they would find the Savior, the Christ, the Messiah. Same word. Christos in the Greek. We get Christ from that. Hamashiach in the Hebrew, Messiah, it means the same thing, the anointed one. And Bethlehem was exactly where Micah had prophesied that the Messiah was to be born. In Micah 5 2, but thou, Bethlehem Ephrata, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall come forth unto me that is the ruler in Israel, whose going forth have been from old, from everlasting. Bethlehem Ephrata. Now they were told they'd find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. They were informed that the birth took place in a barn, in a stable. And it may have surprised them. Most people are surprised at that. It's quite possible that in Bethlehem of that time, there was only one stable. It was not a big city or a big town at that time. And I have an idea they knew exactly where to go to find that stable and find that new child. The shepherds saw and they heard the angels and they believed the message they brought. How do we know that? They believed. They made haste. They did as they were instructed and they found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in the manger. And after they saw this blessed child, they left but they couldn't keep silent. They told everyone they saw about the great event. They were telling everybody they saw about the angels. Like new believers, they couldn't keep quiet. They had to tell everyone they met about the newborn king. How many shepherds came to the stable that night? I have no idea. I feel like it was quite a few of them because it was enough to make Mary and Joseph think about it. What a sight it must have been all those shepherds coming out of the field. Now Mary and Joseph didn't stay in that stable any longer than necessary. As soon as possible, Joseph went out and found a place for them to live there in Bethlehem. It would have been the trip back to Nazareth would have been far too difficult for Mary and a newborn baby. So they settled in Bethlehem for a time, probably between a year or two. Remember, God's in charge of all this. God's in control, and there's a purpose. But we know by everything that we read that the next visitors to Bethlehem in search of the king of the Jews were the wise men from the east. And they come to Jerusalem. And when Herod saw him, he marveled and he mocked the wise men. He was exceeding wroth and sent forth and slew all the children of that were in Bethlehem and all the coast thereof from two years old and under, according to the time that he had diligently inquired of the wise men. That's why we know that they lived in Bethlehem for maybe up to two years. Probably not that long. If they would have said a year, I'm sure that Herod, would have, when he sent the soldiers out to destroy them, would have added a year to make sure he didn't miss anyone. So obviously, the wise men had given a date of one to two years at the sighting of the star and the birth of the Savior. When they arrived in Jerusalem, they asked a question that shook the entire city. 
where is he born king of the Jews? And they said, we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. We didn't read it, but Matthew 2, 3 <clears throat> says it really shook up old Herod in all of Jerusalem because he was troubled in all of Jerusalem with him. I understand why Herod was troubled. I can't understand why the entire city was all shaken up. You know, all, all scholars and all commentary don't always agree on how, what time the Magi arrived in Jerusalem heading to Bethlehem. They apparently came sometime after the birth, six months, a year, two years, we don't know. But it was a while after because we find the that they were in a house at that time. Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, though still in Bethlehem, were in the house. And one of the big proofs that there's a time difference is the fact that later Jesus is called a child, Peidiom, in verses 9 and 11, rather than, as Luke uses it in Luke 2, 12, Bri of us, which means an infant. So by the time that the wise men get there, Jesus is at least a toddler. So the exact time we don't know, but it's been some time after the birth. And the identity of the wise men is impossible to determine. A lot of ideas have been suggested. And sometimes people have given them uh, traditional names and identified them as representatives of the three groups of people described as Noah's sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Most likely, we have no doubt the fact that they were Gentiles and they were in a high position in the country or countries from which they came. And they were given a special revelation by God about the birth of the King of Jews. Now, the special revelation may simply have been in the sky, as indicated by the fact they're called Magi, which we get the word, of course, magician from that, but it means specialist in uh, astronomy. And by the fact that they referred to a star that they saw, maybe that was the revelation. It's possible the revelation came through contact with Jewish scholars who had come to their area with copies of the Old Testament manuscripts. You know, many feel the wise men's comments reflected a knowledge of Balaam's prophecy of the star that would be out of Jacob over in Numbers 24, 7, 17. Whatever the source, those wise men came to Jerusalem to worship the newborn king of the Jews. The Bible doesn't say again how many there were. Whether they were two or 200, I don't know. And we just know that there were, I feel like, quite a few of them. I think it was more than the three that we talk about. Because when they came into Jerusalem, it was probably quite a caravan. And these kings, maybe they came from one country, or maybe they came from several. Maybe there were some from China, maybe Indochina, from Babylon, and maybe they converged somewhere on the road. Not by accident, but by God's plan. We don't know how many, we just know there were more than one. So it's no surprise that Herod was disturbed when they came into Jerusalem looking for the one who was now to be king of the Jews. Keep in mind though that Herod was not the rightful king. He was not from the line of David. In fact, Herod was not even a descendant of Jacob. He was a descendant from Esau. He was Edomite. He reigned because of the power of Rome. He was a puppet king there for them. He reigned for about 41 years. And the very fact that he wasn't from the line of David and that he actually wasn't even from Jacob. He's not even part of Israel. That's the reason he was so hated by most of the, the Jews and they never accepted him truly as king. So if someone is rightfully born king of the Jews, then Jacob's job was in jeopardy. He is thinking about his position and the position of his son to follow. Seemingly, he is untrained and Herod is unfamiliar with the Old Testament scriptures because you notice he calls his scribes, his scholars together, and he asks them a question. Matthew 2, 4. 
When he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where the Christ should be born. Now this is really interesting to me. Herod, who has evidently no knowledge of anything, of prophecy, he doesn't even know where he's going to be born. But his question, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. His mind takes him right to the Messiah. He connects the King of the Jews with the Christ, with Messiah. And he's completely untrained, it appears in Scripture. He has a burden on his heart. So it seems that at least there is a messianic hope about the Messiah being born in Jerusalem at that time. Judea still has a few people, even a pagan king is thinking about that. But the answer to Herod's question is a simple one. As we read earlier in Micah 5 too, he Messiah is to be born in Bethlehem. And so Herod asked the wise men, when did they first see the star? As I said, this becomes critical in a later account because it showed that Herod was already contemplating a way to get rid of this king of the Jews. He's already plotting a murder. This is Herod. Isn't it? You see the true colors of Herod. He requested to those wise men to come back to him once they had found this child because he wanted to go worship him too. That's a lie from the pit. He had no intention of worshiping anyone, especially a child. So when those wise men left Jerusalem, another miracle happened. A lot of times we miss this. The star which had been seen in the east now reappears and it leads them to the exact house in Bethlehem where the child was staying. It's a short trip. It's only about five miles from Jerusalem to Bethlehem. Now I say that this was a miracle because Bethlehem is south of Jerusalem. The star is moving south. If you look into the sky, you'll notice that our stars, those planets, usually travel east to west because of the rotation of the earth. Not north to south. But see, with God, all things are possible. Now I want to ask you a question this morning, something you can ponder throughout Christmas Day. Could that star they saw, which led them to the house where the Lord was, could it have actually been the Shekinah glory of the Lord and not a star? Remember, the Shekinah glory of the Lord led Israel for 40 years in the wilderness by a pillar of smoke or a pillar of fire. Could what they have seen in the east, and they identified it as a star because they didn't know what else to call it, could it have been the Shekinah glory of the Lord? You know, the Lord said, let there be light. Could that have been? I'm not trying to be dogmatic. I'm just trying to give you something to think about. Every effort of man, though, to try to discredit this miracle fails. I'm going to tell you something. This was a miracle of God. That star they saw in the east, whether it's an actual star that God set there, whether it's the Shekinah glory of God, it makes no difference because it was not the conjunction of Jupiter, Saturn, and Mars. It wasn't a supernova. It wasn't a comet. It was the hand of God. It was an absolute miracle. And don't let anybody else try to explain it away. They saw something that God had given them, a direction. They were led to the child, and when they went in, they worshipped him. And they brought him gifts. They heightened their worship by bringing gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. These were gifts that are worthy of a king. And this is an act by Gentile leaders. And you know what? It's also prophecy. I don't know if you've ever seen that before. If you read Isaiah 60 and 61 and Isaiah 66 and Zephaniah chapter 3 and Haggai chapter 2, we kingdom passages and the nations bring gifts to Jerusalem to the Savior. What do they do here? What do these Gentiles bring here? Gifts to the Savior. It's pointing us to the kingdom already. Some believe these gifts had a further significance because they reflect the character of Jesus' life. Gold represents His deity, His purity, His sinlessness. Incense is the 
fragrance of his life and myrrh, his sacrifice and death because myrrh was used in embalming. And quite possibly, this points us in that direction too. But I think the primary reason that these Gentile leaders brought these valuable, and you know, we don't know how much gold was there, how much frankincense and myrrh, because I'm telling you, there are more than three he brought them. But these gifts sustained the family when they had to leave Bethlehem and go into Egypt until Herod died. They had the spoils, so to speak, to supply them while they were gone. Just like God gave the spoils of Egypt to Israel when they left there. The wise men were then warned in a dream not to return to Herod, so they took another route home. So right now we've looked at the long journey of Mary and Joseph, the shorter journey of the shepherds, the long journey of the wise men from the east. But you know, there's one who made a longer journey than any of those. That was the Lamb of God. Our Lord Jesus Christ stepped out of eternity, left the glory of heaven, cloaked himself in human flesh, and made the trip to this earth for you and me. What a journey the Lord took for us to free us from slavery of sin and give us eternal life. There's always a discussion as to why Jesus, <clears throat> King of kings, Lord of lords, was not born in some splendid palace or some other place of comfort and elegance. But it was right and proper, if you think about it, for the Lamb of God to be born in a lowly stable. And the great shepherd, the God of all creation, was visited by who? Shepherds. Those shepherds who came out of the field that night represent the believing remnant of Israel. Those shepherds were also weak little lost sheep who needed a great shepherd to guide and provide and protect and save them. As a matter of fact, later in Matthew 15, 24, Jesus says, I am sent not but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. While most of the nation of Israel rejected the Messiah, a remnant believed and they accepted Jesus. God always has a believing remnant and he's demonstrating that by those shepherds coming that night. But then somewhere between a year or two later, the wise men came to worship the king of the Jews. And those men who came from the east were Gentiles, aliens of the commonwealth of Israel. Those men represent the Gentile world. They represent you and me. And this is what Paul was talking about over in Ephesians 2.12 when he wrote about all of us who before we came to Jesus Christ for salvation, he said, in that time, you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in this world. And when we came to Jesus, what did we bring him? What can we bring him? Can we bring him gold and frankincense and myrrh? Those men did that. They gave what was right, not what was left. They gave as we are to give. They gave with a joyful heart, a heart of love with understanding that they can't outgive the Lord. And they gave as they had been blessed. They trusted that no matter how much they would give, the Lord would continue to bless them. The greatest gifts that you and I can give the Lord Jesus Christ is our hearts, our love, and our faith. And so we see the faithfulness and obedience of Joseph and Mary. We've seen the coming remnant of Israel to worship the king. We see the Gentiles coming with gifts of praise to worship the Lord. There's one more thing that in, in each case we're not told. How many shepherds? How many wise men? Why are we told that? I know we worry about it, we think about it, we make up numbers. But see, the numbers is not important because what it's telling us is whosoever will may come. It doesn't matter about the numbers. 
There's room at the cross for you and me and anyone else. As I close on this Christmas morning, I want to look at one more group who came to find Jesus, and that's Herod's soldiers. You know, we have in the birth of Jesus, the Lord Himself from heaven, the shepherds of Israel, the Gentiles from the east, and now we have one more person making an appearance. That's the old devil himself, the old serpent. He's always there. He's always near. He's tempting, and he's attempting to destroy. And there can be little doubt that Herod represents Satan in the story and his soldiers, the demons. Now, I'm not, I'm allegorizing for purpose. I'm not taking anything away from the real story, but I see these things happening. Herod commands his soldiers to murder the male children two years and younger because the devil has always attempted to keep the Messiah from coming into the world. And then when Jesus did come into the world, the devil wanted to destroy him. It was the devil who tempted all those people to yell, crucify him, as he stood outside the palace of Ted Pilate, thinking that if Jesus were crucified, it would be the end of the Savior. But see, Herod learned something. He learned that he could not defeat the Lord. And that's a lesson the devil and all his fallen angels will have an opportunity to learn for all eternity. On that first Christmas day, Jesus was victorious. In his earthly ministry, Jesus was victorious. In his death and burial and resurrection, Jesus is victorious. And one day he's coming again, first for his church, then following the tribulation, he's going to come and he's going to set up his kingdom on this earth, victorious. And when Satan is defeated forever and all believers step into it, of every age, step into eternity with the Lord. That's victory. Today on Christmas Day, let us too come and adore Him. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Right now, this very minute, we need to come to Jesus. All over the world, let us rejoice in knowing this. And still they come, Jew and Gentile, to worship the King. So let me say this in closing. Jesus is not still in that manger. And Jesus is not still in that cross. Jesus is not still in that tomb. He lives in the heart of every believer on the face of the earth. He's preparing for us a place right this moment. And He's coming again. He's going to snatch us out of here. And He's coming back again to set up His kingdom. So in all these things, let us rejoice on this Christmas day that the Messiah has come. Our Heavenly Father, I thank You that we could come together this morning. Even though we're small in number and so many of our folks are without power and a number of them sick, I pray that You would work in their hearts and their lives and help them. But I pray, Father, that our hearts are encouraged this morning by what You have done for us. The beginning of our gospel message is the virgin birth of our Lord. Father, I pray that we will continue to seek Him in every aspect of our life, not only on Christmas Day, but every day. As we leave this morning, Father, I pray that You would bless us and keep us, give us safety, and help us to have a wonderful, joyful day as we celebrate the birth of our Savior with families. And pray that you would bring us back again at the next appointed time. And I pray as always in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen.